Live here at Barnes & Noble in Homedale, New Jersey, uh, we have got the pleasure of having Mayor Tony Perry joining me right now on First Class Fatherhood. Thank you, uh, Tony. Thanks so much for having me. All right, I like to always start it out like this. How many kids do you have? How old are they? Well, I'm a little crazy. I think people would uh, agree with me. I have two kids under two right now. So I, my daughter, Reagan, is uh, almost two. She's going to be turning two in August. And then I have a five-month-old, Grant. So we kept with the presidential theme named uh, go, going forward. You know, my wife already has the, the third one picked out. But, uh, you know, I'm like, let's, let's slow down a little bit here, you know. Two, two COVID babies, uh, COVID time, but two amazing little kids uh, that, that just bring absolute joy, you know, to, to both of us, even, even at their craziest moments. Um, they're, just, uh, they're just amazing kids, and I love watching them grow up and, and just learn things, you know, that, that, that's the best part. Yeah, very well said. Yeah, I got four of them here, so I know a little yeah, bit about I, it. I, I know, I know. I'm preaching, you know, you're like, I have no sympathy for you. Well, you I, did have a, <laughs> I, I did have the pleasure of meeting your beautiful family at the St. Mary Fair last year. Yes, yes. Uh, so if you could, tell us a little bit about your background leading up to the position of mayor here. Yeah, sure. So, so in, it goes back, actually, when I was in college, my, my junior year of college, I'm, uh, I'm sitting and I'm a junior at Temple University in, in the city of Philadelphia and I get an internship with the now Republican governor of New Jersey, Chris Christie. And don't hold that against me, all right? Um, but uh, but I'm, I'm working for him and, I'm, and I'm, I'm losing money. I'm bleeding money at this point, like every good internship in public offices. I'm not getting paid for it. And I, Hurricane Irene, strikes Monmouth County and so still not getting paid uh, traveling without a car from Philadelphia to Trenton uh, three days a week and I'm going through going through and Hurricane Irene strikes and my boss says you know stick it out stick it out you're gonna be offered a job so about two months before I graduate in 2012 from from Temple I get a job offer uh, I take it immediately and I'm still making basically no money at that time uh, in, as a good public servant and I uh, started working in the, the governor's appointments office so boards and commissions all those things that that the governor gets an appointment to I was uh, I was making um, making help decisions you know make decisions for those boards so I um, I was there, and on 10 28 2012, the day before Hurricane Superstorm Sandy struck, I get a call from my old boss saying, "You're coming back and you're working for me." So that's where really my time in Monmouth County started to absolutely unfold. 2,777 Sandy cases later. Uh, I visited every single county, all 21 counties in the state of New Jersey. I went to 77 different town halls with Chris Christie. And I get a phone call from then Senator Joe Carillos, uh, who represented this district, represented Holmdel for a long time, 30 years in the legislature. And he says, I want you to come be my chief of staff. So I came and I, I became his chief of staff. And you know, when you're working for a guy who's been in the legislature at the time for 26 years, you're often thinking, you know, you're going to be told what to do. This is how it works. This is how it's going to be. And Joe Carrillo's treated me as if I had been in the legislature with him for 26 years. He treated me as my opinion mattered, my my perspective mattered in every single decision, whether it was a big decision or a small decision, how we were going to approach legislation. And right then and there, I mean, I had long been in love with politics and wanting to be in politics. The first campaign I worked on, I was 10 years old. So, you know, looking that far back is, is, is you know, that's a long story. But working for Joe Carrillo's and, and, you know, you think you're in love with politics then. But then when you're, you're sitting with an individual of the stature that he was, that he is still to this day, um, and to, to work on presidential campaigns, to, to work through the different issues of the day, uh, and knowing that this guy has had experiences that I can, can't imagine, and he's taken advice from me, he's, he's listening to me, is, is something to be said. And th those are the things that the, the public doesn't get to see, and, but that's what makes him such an unbelievable person and an unbelievable mentor. So Joe, right after I get married in 2016, 
Joe says, hey, let's go get lunch. So I go get lunch with him, and he takes me to um, the barbecue place in uh, in Red Bank, and our offices were right in the in on the the Navy Sink River. So we we go across the, the river, and I'm fresh off my honeymoon, fresh off, looking at that bill, looking at that credit card bill, saying, oh my God, he better give me a raise here. You know, I, this is this is what this 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 meeting better be about. And he says, Tony, I've decided uh, that I'm not going to seek re-election. So I'm thinking to myself, what can I? What did I buy in Italy that I can send back really quick? Um, because it was nerve-wracking. And but it was a year plus in advance. And and he said, you know, we're we're going to take care of you. We're going to find you a landing spot. So the landing spot that he helped me find was being a member of the Middletown Township Committee. The only problem with that is it only pays four thousand dollars a year. So, you know, that doesn't pay my mortgage. Um, so, uh, but you know, he of course was was very gracious. And um, so, after a year on the township committee, I, I got on at, in November of 2017. Someone had resigned to take another position, and I jumped onto the township committee. And I ran for election in 2018. And the following year, 2019, I got appointed as the mayor, and I've been there ever since. And uh, I've I've loved every moment of it because there are there is a person in each corner of this township uh, of all 42 squ square miles that has impacted me um, and and some of them may not have voted for me but they have come up to me and and told me their feelings their thoughts and we can agree and disagree often but I always wanted to be accessible I always wanted to emulate Joe Carlos and that's what I that's what I hope I've been able to do over the last four years. Well, I'll tell you right now, obviously, uh, the political atmosphere in the country is on fire. I mean, it's, it's definitely uh, a hot button issue no matter how you slice it. Yeah. So what have been some of the challenges for you being a young dad yourself while being the mayor? And what has been the support from your family while you're doing it? Well, first and foremost, my wife um, deserves sainthood, I would assume, at this point. Um, you know, we my first two years as mayor, we didn't have any kids. My last two years as mayor, we went from zero to two. Um, so that it's been an interesting transition, right? Um, it's, it's a little bit different. The deputy mayor, Rick Heibel, who is a parishioner over at, at St. Mary's, great family, three kids. And uh, Rick is, is, is just one of the best people. The Heibel family is just one of the, the, the best families in town. And Rick has been praying for this moment because in 2018, when he and I ran together, we walk in, you know, this is this is when I knew I was going to win in 2018. There's there's that moment that you have that there's, there's, I feel it, you know, like I know it's going to happen. Here it, here it comes. And it was the, the, um, we, the night of, uh, or the afternoon um, of our Veterans Day parade. And we're walking in mini sink, uh, the, the mini sink section of Middletown, and we're knocking on doors. And 80-20, no doubt was like, we're, I'm with you, I'm with you, I'm with you. So you're walking around like, we're going to keep on knocking on doors. So Rick is saying to me, Tony, you just had me walk two and a half miles in the, in the Veterans Day Parade. Now you have me walking five miles through this neighborhood. Can we at least get some pizza? I said, absolutely not, because until somebody tells me that they're not voting for us, we're not leaving this district, okay? But, um, the, you know, the, the challenges that you face are the same challenges that a lot of people face all across all, all across you know, New Jersey, that, that every elected official, regardless of your political affiliation, right? We're, we're all facing um, overdevelopment in our towns, that the state is not providing us the resources necessary to prevent that from happening. Um, we're all facing unfunded mandates that, that of, of big shiny items that sound good in Trenton, uh, but don't reflect well for the municipalities or, or we're not even asked for our input. So, you know, having a strong family base, having people there that are, are willing to understand that you're not going to be for, there for dinner, you're not going to be there for lunch, you're not going to be for there for breakfast, you're not changing any diapers, you know, you, that, that you're going to be babysitting, that when things are going wrong, I'm not going to be accessible. And the, the fact that my wife has put up with that for as long as she has, um, I love her for the you know but but she knows how important it is and and that 
what we're doing, what I'm doing, and what the township committee is doing here in Middletown is not for me. It's not to help myself. It's not to help Alana and I. It's it's to help our and, and ensure that I'm able to pass along a Middletown and, and, and really a Monmouth County that is great for my kids, the, for my kids to enjoy, for my kids to grow up in, and for my kids to call home is, is what I want to leave behind. It's not a legacy that, that I hope to have. It's a legacy of a great place to, to live, work, and raise a family. And that's, that's what we're trying to do. Yeah, very well said. And it's a scary time for parents right now all across the country with everything going on. I want to jump into just a couple of the issues. Yeah. Obviously, uh, we had the school shooting down in Houston. It's got parents on alert. Yeah. We've already always been that, having it in the back of our minds. Sure. Uh, so I know it's, you know, it's a contentious issue, the entire thing with guns. What is, I know, I've, I've noticed uh, more police presence at the Middletown schools uh, since that has happened. Are we going to continue to see more of that? What is Middletown's plans to make sure that the kids are going to be safe come this fall? Yeah, you, you know, the, the, the number one priority of every elected official, and, and Pam Richmond from Howell is here and, and she knows this, it is public safety. Your, your public has to be safe, period. That always has to be your number one priority. And that's why you have to work with a great, have, have a great police chief, and Craig Weber, my police chief in town, is, is one of the most stand-up human beings you're ever going to find. Uh, long, you know, lifelong Middletown resident who understands how to get things done. Um, so that always has to be your number one priority. In conjunction with the, your Board of Education, their top priority has to be providing a great education for your children. So you have to weigh both of those. So obviously, you can't predict evil. You, you, you just you, you can't predict evil and and what happened in Uvalde is is something that I can't imagine I, I, I never want any human being um, to ever have to imagine or, or deal with something like that but the the morning after uh, the, the the shooting in Texas um, I called up the the Board of Education president Frank Capone and I said Frank I said four years ago I tried to put class three police officers in all of our schools. And I said the Board of Education at the time said that they didn't want armed police officers in our schools. Now, I don't really remember a time not having a police officer in our school, having a school resource officer, something that, that was beneficial, I think, to, to, to me and, and to, to folks that, in, that I graduated with. So I said, to, I said to Frank, I said, let's get this done. So we called an emergency shared services meeting, standing committee that we have between the township and the Board of Ed, and I said, I'm not leaving this, this conference room until we have an agreement. Because I'm not going out there, and I'm not saying to one more person, not one more time, am I going out there and saying that we are just going to do status quo. So I called up the chief. The chief comes in. Chief you got to get a police officer to every single school for drop off and pick up for the rest of the year and then i want two roving police officers going to each of the schools throughout the day no problem got it done not only did we have two we had 16 police officers roving the entire town for the final four weeks of the of the school year but the the great thing that we did was even though it's four years too late in my opinion and and Fortunately, and thank God, we, we haven't had any need for uh, an armed police officer in our schools. But like I said, you can't predict evil. And beginning in the next school year, the township and the Board of Education came to an agreement right at that conference room table that an armed police officer will be in all 16 of our schools for the 2022-2023 school year, to providing that sense of safety, not just for our students, for our staff, and for every single visitor that comes through those doors, they're gonna be protected. Awesome, yeah, as a resident and kids in the school system, I love to hear that. And one of the things that I know, Matthew McConaughey spoke at the White House about this issue. Yeah. I had Matthew on the show, yeah. and one of the things I wish he would have dug into, and people that listen to my podcast know I harp on it all the time, and that's the fatherless crisis that we mm -hmm. have going on in our country now. Yep. I know wherever you sit on with, with the guns and what's happening, 
uh, one of the stats that I, I just put out there recently is that the number of the percentage of gun ownership in this country hasn't changed in the last 50 years. Mm -hmm. It's been hovering around 42, 44 percent. The number of fatherless households has gone from 9 percent to 25 percent. It's almost tripled yeah. in that same period of time. So I know it's more than just one thing to point to. In my opinion, I think if we could strengthen our family units and get more dads back into the house, I think a lot of these problems would start to go away. What's your take? I, I, I don't disagree with you at all. I think that uh, the, the first place, you know, a, a big conversation that has occurred since the, the, the shooting in Uvalde was about mental health. And what and, and I think that's a conversation that we need to have, right? We need to talk about mental health. But you also look at the, the fatherless households and think about the impact that that has on a child. Think about the impact that that has on a family when you have absentee um, parents, you know, and, 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 and fatherless parent uh, children. So I, I think that, you, you know, it's, it's the same thing with a lot of debates that we're having in New Jersey and across the country is, you know, we, we have to get back to basics. We have to get back to the basics in, in, in a lot of what we do. And, and I don't mean, you know, in everything, but, you know, when I was a kid growing up, you know, at, at some points during my life, my, my dad worked during the day, my mom worked at night. But you had that two hours in between that my mom saw us come home from school. She helped us with our homework. She put dinner on the table. My dad would come home from work. My mom would go to work and my dad would, would finish out the day. And, you know, because, because they, they, were, they were two working class people, hard, hard middle class people who were just trying to do what was right for their kids. Because, you know, the philosophy that I've taken and I've said a hundred times is I really believe that, you know, it, it's the goal of every parent to provide their children with a better life than they had. And I was fortunate. And my fortune was seeing two hardworking individuals trying to make ends meet for, the, for their four kids. And I think that is, is the basics that we need to get to. You know, Jack Chitterelli, when he was running for governor last year, he kept saying, and, and as Ronald Reagan used to say, right, the kitchen table. That's what it was all about, was the kitchen table where conversations should happen, where people should understand what's happening in their kids' lives. And if we got back to that kitchen table and, and that philosophy on life, and we had those conversations, you, you know, I don't think we would have the, the, the mental health crisis that we have. I don't think that we would have the tragedies that we see. Um, so I, I think that we, you know, we need to get back to, to those basics and we need to get back to that kitchen table. Yeah, there's no doubt about it. I say the same thing and my four kids, they're here. My favorite part of the day is we sit down as a family every night, six o'clock, and we eat dinner together. We mm -hmm. pray together and it's an important part of our family. It's sure. the best part of my life, uh, my day-to-day -day life. So, yeah. uh, And then moving that right over into the next, and then we'll get back into the, the funner part of this. But another thing that I'm concerned about too here, starting in the fall here in New Jersey, the curriculum is going to change yeah. and it's still being debated hopefully things will change here but they're going to start to introduce sexual orientation gender orientation to kids first second and third grade mm -hmm. now i had governor desantis on the podcast recently mm -hmm. uh i think he's the most pro father pro family guy sure. in politics and i love the fact that he was protecting the kids from that mm -hmm. i kind of wanted to get your take on mm -hmm. what you think now that your kids will be entering the school system uh what is your take on that and what does middletown plan on doing come the fall yeah my take is mind your business um, mind your business. Um, you know what? I, I don't remember ever in my life, in my, in K through 12, ever needing a teacher to discuss with me what I like, didn't like, um, because it's none of your business. Um, again, those conversations are for the kitchen table. Those conversations, you know, and every kid should have to have the awkward conversations that they have with their parents, right? You, you, you know, it's, it's, I'm looking forward to it with, with, with mine, you know, but because I had to go through that punishment. Um, so I, I think it all goes back to it, uh, exactly what I was saying before is, is go back to the kitchen table. The discussions that, that we all had with our parents and the conversations uh, about those topics with our parents should remain with our parents. And they should remain with the individuals that we choose to divulge that information to. And I think this, this premise that it's, it's a teacher's job to do that or an administrator's job and the fact that Trenton believes that uh, frightens me. Because what's next? 
what's the next thing that they're going to require so uh whatever you know whatever side of 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 all the issues you find yourself you know on i think everybody can agree with the fact that the discussions with a kindergartner through second grader that you see this curriculum for I don't want a sixth or seventh grader to know that kind of discuss that. You know why? Because they should be focusing on academics. They should be focusing on sports. They should be focusing on friends. They should be focusing on doing kid stuff, learning kids things, running around, falling down in every situation possible, and picking yourself back up. I think that's what we really need to to, to stress. And you know the, these this idea that we we should do i mean it goes back to the mass though in the schools too you, you know it, it it the the teachers were were supposed to punish the students for the for the mask wearing and stuff like that like you know th- there comes a point where you, you're not taking the place of a parent you're not taking the place of, of somebody in their in their house you're here to teach my child because i'm paying a heck of an amount in property taxes or tuition and and that's your job so i think we should go back to that you know we don't have to go back to leave it to beaver days but you can also like have a find a happy medium i think you know that that, that there certainly that certainly exists yeah i couldn't agree with you more and i do know that i mean today was the last pizza day i always volunteer on pizza day at my uh, my kids school i sit down for with the free them. pizza or well that puts part, <laughs> part of it yeah plus i'm trying to push my show and book on all hey. the kids out of there. But, uh one of the things that i, I enjoy though when i do it after we serve the pizza i sit down at their table i get a chance to talk to their friends and i have a daughter she's in second grade they're seven years old and as i'm sitting there and we're eating pizza listening to these conversations about whatever it may be the elf on the shelf or whatever yeah. they're talking yep. about i can't help but think about how disgusting it is that there are adults that want to sit at a table like this and discuss that type of stuff with our kids. Um, so I pray that we can keep it out of our New Jersey schools. Well, I, I know that you know my board of education. We I've discussed this at length with them. They are they are certainly working very hard to uh, push back on it. They have been pushing back on it. They've been asking for amendments and, and certain things to be made. We've had conversations with the Senate uh, Education Chairman to express the concerns that they that we have about that and I, i'm glad to that that those uh those frustrations and those concerns were heard yeah and as you mentioned there too kids should be out having the fun doing the fun things some of those things can be done here in middletown i mentioned at the top i first met you at the saint mary fair yeah. which i think is like the best event that we have in middletown yeah, yeah, last yeah. year that 50 50 was over 160 k 160 thousand which i was never a- do any 50 50s because i always feel obligated that i have to give the 50 back you know <laughs> my, my 50 back well I, I think that's one of the best events what are some of the other middletown events that the families can really look forward to this summer well, you know, obviously Middletown has, we have our, our, the three great beaches in town in, in Ideal Beach, then Bayshore Waterfront Park where the Spy House is, and, and Leonardo Beach. You know, and, and what most people don't know is that when you look at a map of New Jersey, everybody can identify kind of where, you know, you see the, the coast and you see the very top of the coast with Sandy Hook. Well, Sandy Hook is part of Middletown, right? All of Sandy Hook is, is Middletown Township. So we really are the beginning of the Jersey Shore. And, you know, I'm really proud of that. We have the oldest lighthouse in America, Boston Light, despite what the city of Boston tells you, is not the oldest lighthouse in America. It is, it is the Sandy Hook Lighthouse because we are the most continuously used one. You can shut your light off. That doesn't make you a lighthouse anymore, okay? So, um, so you know, I, I really am proud of, of the, the fact that we have such beautiful beaches. And, we, you know, we have over 6,000 acres of open space and, uh, and more than 70 parks. Uh, between our county parks, our, our municipal parks, our state parks that we have, and you know, riding the Henry Hudson Trail, going up to Twin Lights, you know, going into Thompson Park, uh, you know, at Porcy Park in Middletown, we have one of the the uh, only sites still preserved, a uh, working farm still preserved by that that was owned by Joseph Murray, and Joseph Murray was a loyalist to the uh, to the American rebels and um, was was executed right at his farm for being an american patriot and to think about that history to think about all that we have within our 42 square miles you know i can talk about all the parades and everything but the the history that we have the beauty that we have uh, i hope is appreciated by by as many that that can get out here because we we truly are a beautiful beautiful town 
Yeah, well said. And we need that because uh, Jersey gets beat up all the time, you know, especially in the media and on the news. Always gets oh, a yeah. bad rap. But uh, it's a great place to raise a family. Like I said, my wife and I, we've been here now 12 years. We moved down from Bayonne. We really fell in love with the neighborhood. We really love raising our kids here. It's yeah. such a great place to raise our kids. And uh, so then getting back to you uh, as a father here, what would you consider to be the top values that you hope to instill in your kids growing up? Well, I think the top value is uh, the importance of a community. I think it's it's what I tell all the kids, whether it's at a Boy Scout event or, you know, uh, a school that invites me to come, Girl Scouts, whatever the case may be, is every person's ability to be a leader, regardless of what position they hold, how old they are. Um, you can being a leader doesn't come with your name placard that says mayor underneath of it. You know, that that that, that doesn't make you a leader. Uh, what what makes an individual a leader is somebody who's willing to step out and step forward to help other people, and I think what what I, what my parents instilled in me, what what I hope to instill in in into my kids is that every single day they have an opportunity to wake up and do something really great. You know, not every day are you going to do something really great. But when you go home and you're able to put your head on the pillow at night, knowing that you impacted somebody's life just a little bit, knowing that you were able to assist somebody, and, and no one is, may know what you've done. No one may know how you helped them. But knowing that you were able to make their life just a little bit easier, that's what being a leader is, in my opinion. And that's what I hope to instill in, in both of my children, is, is that in every day they have that opportunity, and I hope that they take that opportunity as many days as they can. Yeah, wow, very well said. And since we are here at Barnes & Noble, do you have any type of children's books that you like to read to the kids, and what does your bedtime routine look like with them? Well, I think my daughter is purposely trying to tongue-tie me because of her selections for books all of a sudden have become a lot of Dr. Seuss, um, which I know, you know, you know, canceled, you know, another, another thing canceled in the world. But um, yet yeah, she's been doing a lot of a lot of Dr. Seuss, and we're going through the the Dr. Seuss ABC book, and the Z. I always I, I don't hope that she walks away from me when we get by the time we get to Z because that's the only word like I struggle to pronounce at the end, and it's like a you know zitter zitter you know zoomy or something like that, and I'm like oh gosh here we go we're getting to Z here today, but um, but you. Know, well, you know, for for us, it's a little bit it's a little bit insane trying to to get both kids to sleep because it all depends kind of on on my schedule a little bit because I'm running in and out all all day long, all weekend long, and so. But I do try, and my favorite part of the day is actually waking up in the morning because my my daughter will wake up and her you know my son will already be awake. But my son waking my daughter up is like the best thing ever. So when she sits there and she's, you know, sprawled out throughout our bed and and my son decides, you know, he's going to be awake for an hour now and starts, you know, you know, he, he doesn't. But we do it on purpose to wake her up because she can't be mad at us when a five month old is looking at her. Right. So, you know, it, it, it's different every day, you know, but uh but it is, it is amazing to see them growing up together and interacting together. How are the pipes? Do you have any lullabies in you? Do you hit them with any songs at night? Or? So, so, you know, it's funny because um, my daughter, you know, she goes to daycare and the, the itsy bitsy spider has become, you know, a, was a favorite for a, a good amount of time, but then all of a sudden wheels on the bus started coming. And like, I'm like, I don't. I can't remember. You know all the all the things. So by the by the end, I'm sitting there and I'm thinking to myself, okay, I got the doors, I got the horn, I got the the driver, I have the windshield wipers, and I had the wheels. I'm like, what other part of this bus can I think of? Because if I stop, she's gonna freak out. Um, so the the definitely the wheels on the bus has become a a, a favorite. That is is, I'm hoping we can find another thing to, to start singing um, because if I have to do itsy bitsy or wheels on the bus again 
I'm gonna have to start coming up with new parts of this uh, of this bus, I think, you know, or the spider's gonna have to do something different because I can't have it run up the water spout anymore. Well, I'll tell you, I, I used to sing songs to them from Sound of Music, and it would help put them to sleep. It will wake the well, neighbors way, up. Because way to my make, voice way to is make me feel like a bad dad. <laughs> Sound of Music, I'm doing itsy bitsy spider, you know. You gotta do what it takes. Uh, that's yeah, it. Yeah. That's all you gotta do. Whatever works. Obviously, uh, fatherhood is the big thing for me. I got the book First Class Fatherhood: Advice and Wisdom from High Profile Dads. The whole show focuses on fathers uh, and fatherhood. Father's Day. I'm putting this episode out on Father's Day. What does the perfect Father's Day look like for you? Well, I've this is my, I guess this is my second Father's Day because my daughter was born right after Father's Day. Um, but my my, what does Father's Day mean to me? I mean, th- this Father's Day, you know, my entire family's going to uh, a baseball game. And so my dad's going to be there. All of uh, my brothers and sisters are going to be there. All of our kids are going to be there. My brother's son's going to be there. And I think that for for me, being in and out all day long, right, being in and out all day long and, and you know, I, 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 there's no doubt that I, I miss certain things, obviously, throughout the day. But knowing that I'm going to take those four hours of, America's pastime and kind of enjoy them with my dad, with my kids, with my brothers and sisters. That that's really the the best Father's Day I, I could probably ask for because it 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 brings us back, right? It, I mean, I go back to you know going to to Phillies games with my dad at Veterans Stadium, and you know tough crowds at Veterans Stadium in Philadelphia. There's no doubt, but going back, I, I you know thinking about him there being there with him and and uh and just enjoying america's pastime is, is really just a great day for me yeah and obviously you love the politics you love what you're doing what kind of political aspirations do you have how far do you want to go here are we going all the way to whole bowl of soup right to the white <laughs> house or are you looking what's the next step in the progression of this for you you know uh, politics is is a it's an interesting game right that that we play and pam knows this but you, you know you, you, ne- you never know what, what cards are going to be dealt for you. And, you know, politics often just has to be what's right for you um, and what's right for you at that time. Um, forcing it in is not going to work. But um, I, I'm incredibly humbled that for four years, um, which is longer than anybody since the the early 60s has served as the mayor for four consecutive years in Middletown and because we rotate every year uh, you're supposed to rotate every year um, I think the the other people in the township committee are like thank God he wants to do it because I you know I but um, what political aspirations do I have you know I, I just want to go where I'm able to affect change and if that means that I stay forever in Middletown then that means I stay forever in Middletown. If that means I go, you know, someplace else, I just want to be able to do things the right way. I want to get things done because that's what we owe to the people that we represent. And uh, I'm not going to do anything that that makes me feel like I'm just taking up a seat because I'm not going to do that. I'm a pretty vocal person and uh, I'm going to I'm going to speak my mind. So that can be a good thing and a bad thing sometimes, but um, but I, I'm, I'll continue to speak my mind, and, and where that takes me, we'll see. Yeah, great stuff. Uh, last thing I want to hit you with here, I love to ask all the dads that I get on the podcast, what type of advice do you have for that new dad or for that about-to-be father who's out there listening? <sighs> um, the best advice I can give, that's a good question. I haven't really thought about that. But the best advice I can give is... You know, my daughter was born right at the, the, the height of the pandemic. And I was I was mayor at the time. And I, you know, was still running in and out of the house, um, even though COVID was, was shutting a lot of things down. But now seeing my daughter almost at two years old, there is a regret that I have about not being there every day right not not being able to do everything um so my advice is to treasure that time especially right at the beginning for all those new dads is really to treasure that because 
you know, it's a cliche to say, well, in an instant, it, it's going to be different. But but it really is. And I don't think it, until you realize it, 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 you look back and you're like, oh, that, that advice was really good. But it, it is when, when, when you first look at that baby boy, baby girl, and you realize that your world has now been been taken over um, by by these children, it's the best thing that's ever going to happen to you. And it's going to be tough you know, in the beginning, but treasure each and every one of those moments because, you know, eventually they're going to tell you no and hey and and things like that. And they're not going to want to talk to you. But that's the natural progression that you that you can treasure that in the beginning, realize that they're going to become their own person. Um, and then eventually you hope that they're your best friend in the end and that you can enjoy the things that you enjoyed with your parents, you enjoyed with your dad. And I think that that's, that's the, the message I would tell every, every new dad. Yeah. Very well said. I love the message. This has been an honor for me. I got to say, Mayor Tony Perry, you're a first class father all the way. And thank you so much for giving me a few minutes of your time. Thank my first you, class my father. friend. Appreciate it. Thank you very much.